Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Joe Jaffe, who is editor-publisher of the German publication Die Zeit and the author, most recently, of Uber Power, The Imperial Temptation of America. Tell, them, tell them also about st the Stanford connection. Oh, please, of Just course. Just because we're at Berkeley. That's correct. And he is a visiting professor. You know, a senior fellow. A senior fellow. At the Institute <laughs> for, uh, for International Studies. And in what we call this fancy word, consulting professor of political science. Oh, this is very important. And a fellow at the Hoover Institution. I have to list all these affiliations because otherwise these organizations will be insulted. Well, I'm glad to know that. But should I ask you, which side will you sit on at the Stanford uh, Cal game? Oh, oh, come on. It's obvious <laughs> yeah. when you're sitting at the Stanford side. <laughs> well, anyway, welcome to Berkeley, uh, you Joe. Could ask that question? Yes. So, uh, in your book, you, you call the United States an uber power. What, what is an uber power? Well, if you, if you, in terms of your material resources that go into the making of power, are so far out that you're no longer in the same league with your, with your nearest competitors, and though you know, as we all know, we are now speaking in the fall of 19, <coughs> 2007, though this uber power has fallen upon hard times um, with various of its ventures, if you look at the material sources of power, it is still out there in the stratosphere. Just a couple of examples. Its GDP is more than three and a half times larger than that of the next competitor, Japan. That has never happened in history, no. So Britain was more had more of an economy than the French and the Germans had more, but it was always within range. Where this is 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 a matter of kind of factor three. And the second one, the most dramatic um, uh, number I think in history is that this Uber power spends as much on on its military as the, the rest of the world combined, mm -hmm. and that too is absolutely unprecedented. And if you add to that the kind of pervasive cultural power that this country has over the rest of the world, both in the pop and high culture field, um, that, that I think just those three factors um, permit uh, this kind of hyperbole, which is uber power. Mm -hmm. and, and how does our situation today compare what it was in the post-World War II world where bipolarity existed? Well, in those days, right immediately after the after World War II, the United States was good for half of the world's GDP. Today, it's only a quarter of GDP. Uh, so you might say <coughs> it is today uh, weaker than than 50, 60 years ago. The more significant point that I would want to make is that for all of its material might, which I just recited. Uh, that was power frozen, power devalued, power, it's like a frozen bank account. It doesn't matter how much money you have. And it was frozen because of the Cold War and bipolarity because there was another such almost uber power, or at least one that pretended to be one, the Soviet Union, which confronted and contained and thus neutralized and diminished American power and vice versa. So, on some levels, the U.S., uh, the economic one, made up m was surely even more dominant 60 years ago. But you know, until the end of the Soviet Empire, it was Gulliver in ropes, mm -hmm. frozen bank account. And and I, I think uh, you would say that nuclear weapons. The, that a key element of the bipolarity was nuclear weapons really uh, uh, affected what either side could do. Yeah. I think I think nuclear weapons, contrary to what our mutual mentor Ken Waltz has 
written for the past 50 years made a lot of difference, and for obvious reasons. Um, you know, the scorpion in the bottle image, that is, or this overwrought image, if I sting you first, you'll still be able to give me a deadly sting and we'll both die. Uh, if you shoot first, you die later, all these similes. It just meant that the 60, the 60 years of bipolarity were uh, miraculously uh, free from major war. Uh, th though those two superpowers, or their alliances kind of stood there with, you know, clenched fists and bared teeth, and uh, trying to out-arm and out-compete the other side, never did they fire a shot in anger, at least not directly those two superpowers that fought proxy wars. But they would never in, the, in that time sh fire sh uh, shoot a fire shot in anger, and that is, again, something that's totally unprecedented in the annals of international history, and it's, I think it's obvious. You don't want to loosen a shot for fear of bringing down you know, Armageddon on you and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And in, in that bipolar world, what, what was the position of allies of the United States? What, uh, how, how far, what were the limits to which uh, contain their deviation from what the United States wanted? We want to look at both sides? Yes, yeah. I mean, on the other side, in the East, allies ran on the shortest of leashes. And uh, the slightest deviationism, as we used to call it in the communist vernacular, led to speedy and brutal recentralization. So you go back to the 50s and 60s, the East Germans, the Poles, the, the Czechs, they all tried to lengthen the leash or loosen it. And what they got was the most brutal kind of reoccupation, um, recentralization. Western powers had basically two choices. <clears throat> One is to stay on the leash and be the best possible dog and please your, please your master, so to speak, and thus gain influence over him. Those, of, those viewers who have dogs know that dog strategy. They are very smart. They, they please you, and as a result, they get what, what they want from you. Uh, the, the subsidiary or minor strategy was, was the opposite, which was practiced by the French, which was to stay in the alliance but maximize your nuisance value. This is a dog who would always bark, uh, who'd always run away, uh, and had to be lured back with, with goodies. Um, and that gave to, to France, which you know, De Gaulle and his successors, um, a certain mm, derivative power, which was not their own uh, you know, autonomous strength, but derivative, um, which derived from, the, from, from maximizing their nuisance value. And so the French were in a position where a real economy power that always looking for upgrades into business, and it sometimes worked. Mm -hmm. So now, those were the two alternatives for Now look, looking Alice. back at that period uh, where we try to understand the way American institutions interface with the, the policy of choice, namely containment, it, 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 in retrospect, it seems to have worked beautifully. W what accounts for that? It's the most brilliant phase of any country's diplomacy. It was certainly the golden age of American diplomacy because the U.S. built or put a stamp on this whole slew of international institutions which are with us today. You know, the UN, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, uh, the agreement on, on free trade which is now sprouted into the World Trade Organization, the Marshall Plan, um, the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, so a whole alphabet soup of institutions made in the USA. And the genius about these institutions, why, why they worked so well, is that they served not only American interests, but they served the interests of others too. In that respect, they created adherence to the institutions and loyalty to the institution builder and institution manager. So, Never has anybody um, uh, executed more brilliant diplomacy than the U.S. in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and all the way into the 70s. 
And, and really it was about American values defining American interests in institutions that actually supported the interests yeah. of other powers. Well, think about the World Trade Organizations. If you're a number one export power in the world, you have an interest in free trade. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you want everybody else to, to engage in free trade, which is also good for them. Free trade is always good for everybody. Uh, so um, that's how American interests were ser served both America and the rest. But there was also more to it. It was not just hege pure hegemony, but it was a liberal hegemony, a liberal order, an open order, a free trade order, one of exchange, one of institutional arrangements. So it was not kind of, you know, the classic imperial order like Rome or or the Ottoman Empire, or what have you, but it was a liberal international order, and that reflected very much, I think, the some basic, a basic American ideology, which grew out of the 18th century liberalism, out of which America was born. It's the only true child of the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. the United States. And, and what about American leadership over the, the course of the Cold War? It, do you think that, it, that the that the structure of international politics uh, uh, help make our leaders better by uh, limiting the options of what they can do? Or was it a reflection of, of national culture? That's a very interesting question. I, I, I don't quite want to put it down to national culture because if you go back to the 19th century, there were some real adults uh, <laughs> uh, in the White House. People whose name we've long forgotten, or we, they have, we have sort of streets named after. We don't really know what Tyler did and Harrison did and Buchanan, uh, even Grant as a president. He was a great general. So, so maybe what I'm here, what I'm speculating is that under the pressure of global leadership, from which there was no escape, maybe the United States couldn't afford the Tylers or Harrisons or Buchanans, and so it had some pretty impressive characters, I think. Truman was a very impressive guy. Uh, Eisenhower's reputation is growing by the year as he recedes into history. Kennedy is a myth, we don't know how good he is. Um, Johnson, we still have to debate. Nixon, we know that he was a great diplomatist, though not a very lovable person. And Ronnie Reagan, I mean, he's probably going to go down as among the very great because he brought down the Soviet Empire without firing a, a, a single shot. So there were some, um, I think in, in general, the, maybe the age of American leadership brought forth some, um, some impressive figures. And maybe the post-Cold War period when the dangers to this country kind of declined Maybe that's what explains why we have the president we have right now. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, but yeah. the, 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 the break comes, the end of the era comes uh, with the, the fall of the wall uh, and uh, the end of the Soviet Union. And in your book, you make reference to what was the first effort to come up with a mission statement for America in this new world. Uh, uh, it, it's it's a, a document not discussed enough, the Pentagon guidance mm -hmm. document that was written in Cheney's shop when he was Secretary of Defense under President Bush one. One. Yeah. Talk a little about that document because it, it, it said, hey, we've got a problem. I mean, we no yeah. longer have an adversary. Well, I mean, it immediately, almost immediately reflected the death of empire, the death of the Soviet Union, uh, Gulliver's ropes had fallen off, the bank account had mm. been unfrozen, whatever metaphor you want to use. And so scholars of international politics, of which you are one, and our, com our, our mentor uh, Ken Waltz is, is, is the greatest, could have predicted this. Suddenly, when power is un unbalanced, Mm -hmm. It will create temptations, and the next step, it will create counterpower, countervailing power. So hardly had the Soviet Union disappeared on um, Christmas Day, 1991, when this um, 
what is the the defense guidance emerge the, from the, the uh, defense guidance document? I think it's called. Yeah, emerge was leaked to the press, and which kind of celebrated the new this new unipolar moment, as some of the pundits would call it later. Celebrated the the fact that the ropes had come off, but immediately drew the right conclusions, which which is. We want to stay what we are, we want to stay number one, and therefore we have to make sure, and that's what the guidance goes into a great, great length, how to prevent other competitors from rising to our level, threatening us singly or in combination by ganging up on us. So the Pentagon boys, boys had, had studied their international history and they understood that unbalanced power will create balances and they were thinking about how are we going to keep our rivals from ganging up on us and, and pulling us down from this penthouse of power which we're now occupying? Now, in, in the interim period uh, before uh, uh, President Bush came in and before 9-11, uh, President Clinton seemed to be groping yeah. for some mission uh, and <clears throat> for the country. He, he really, I think it's fair to say, never really came up with one other than identifying uh, uh, the specialness of America's uh, role in the world. Madeleine Albright has a phrase which I can't remember right now, but, but, but we, we were kind of in an intellectual vacuum with regard mm. to foreign policy, or is that an no, overstatement? I think, I think whereas the, the Bush 41 boys started looking at the world in cold, realistic and structural terms, uh, the the uh, and the, the Baker boys, uh, the the Clinton the Clinton boys and girls, <laughs> women, uh, yes, Clinton men and women, um, went back to an older tradition of American foreign policy ideology, which is we shall vanquish by example. Mm -hmm. This goes back to to a period in to the late nineteenth century, a uh, late eighteenth uh, century, after the founding, and it kind of kind of preoccupies the rhetoric in the early 19th century and America was still reasonably weak though though moving up at a rapid clip towards towards economic and strategic power so the idea is we will, will not go abroad in search of monsters to slay that was I think Madison um, Adams, I think. what Adams yeah. Adams and Madison yeah. I was kind of uh, and we had uh, we had Jefferson, by the way, who spoke about let's not get involved in entangling alliances. So we had this 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 foreign policy doctrine that said we shall remain aloof, we shall stay. Therefore, we can stay pure, and won't be infected by those evil games played by princes and potentates. And we we are on the right side of history. We are the very embodiment of the, of the Enlightenment. Remember that was a very optimistic theory about political affairs, and history is on our side, I and mean, there's not much we have to do for history to triumph. And if you use that template uh, on the Clintonistas, it fits extremely well. So you have all these, there's a lot of triumphant rhetoric. Uh, Clinton, you had uh, Madeleine Albright, you had uh, Strobe Talbot, who was number two in the State Department. And they were all kind of spouting this, well, yes, almost uh, enlightenment to rhetoric that history was on our side, it was going the right directions. This time it was driven by technology, the fax machine, the internet, and so on. That in the end, all people would be, peoples would be free and democratic and therefore peaceful. Let me add one thing. This democratic peace theory of Bush 43 that only that democracies don't, don't go to war, was originally and very loudly and repetitively touted by the Clinton boys and girls, Clinton mm -hmm. men and women. So we don't need to do anything. We don't have to exert our power. We are on a roll. History will vindicate us. And as you know, the Clintonists had to be dragged into, into using military force, kicking and screaming. They finally agreed to to, to bomb uh, Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic was Serbia in 99, but they were kicking and screaming. Mm -hmm. And of course this changed when we got a new president and then that new president 
uh, had to deal with uh, the terrorist yeah. attack yeah. of 9-11. Uh, as, as somebody steeped in international politics and theory, what was changed by 9-11? Well, you know the famous line, nothing will ever be the same. That was, of course, uh, uh, an, ex an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you have to kind of delve into, into national psychology, which I don't like to do, but I'll give you the cliché anyway. This was, you know, 3,000 people dead. First attack on American territory since the Brits burnt down Washington in the War of 1812, unless you count Pearl Harbor as, as an American territory. At the heart, it was the heart of the empire, the heart of its economic engine, financial capitalist system that works. Well chosen, in other words. So uh, I think that, that he responded to the trauma of, of terrorism in a way that was very different from the kind of lackluster, kind of almost leave me alone, I don't give a damn response of the Clinton administration. Remember, the 80s, the 90s, had witnessed a whole series of terrorist attacks on the U.S., including the attempt to bring down the Twin Towers. But, you know, Nairobi, and, and before that in the 80s, Le Lebanon, so on, the attacks in America. So I can only explain it by this kind of traumatic shock, and you add fear to pride and power, and that's a pretty potent mixture. Mm -hmm. So he goes off and goes to war, and it very far away. And, and it becomes important to then bring up your insights about uber power, other people call it hyper power, whatever. It's we're always call the same prefix. Yeah. Uber is German for hyper, which is, which is Greek for super, which is Latin. <laughs> okay. Always the same so, stuff. So we're, we're talking <laughs> about not only that the U.S. found itself vulnerable, but, but uh, also in a way, uh, unconstrained, unfettered. Uh, yeah. You used, by the way, we should explain to uh, the audience the reference to Gulliver. Well, yes, you're right, we should. Gulliver was a mythical giant who, well, a, a normal person who uh, gets shipwrecked and ends up in the land of the Lilliputians, which are only six inches tall. And so obviously a six foot high tall man is gonna be a giant with enormous power. And the only way to, that, in the end, the, the Lilliputians could deal with him, certainly couldn't fight him, or subdue him, is to kind of give him a, a sleeping potion, I think, and then while he was asleep, roping him, you know, tying up in ropes. Mm -hmm. That's the Gulliver with or without the ropes image. And after there's a, I think there's a Walt Disney um, cartoon movie, no? Right, but it's, it's a novel by Jonathan Swift, right? Correct, yes, right. correct. Right. Right. Uh, and it was used, I guess, by Stanley Hoffman. In Correct. The, uh, yeah. So we should uh, have Give a footnote credit, there. Yes, yeah. Yes. Uh, but so so th this then that is an unfettered Gulliver, now superpower, uh, does a lot to uh, help us understand not the particular course necessarily that we took after 9/11, but but the but the, the this the sense of we're going to go it alone, we're going to move outside of institutions as necessary. Yeah. Well, let so me just kind of again do the, do the cross, kind of the cross-cutting with the Clintonistas. Yes, please. The Soviet Union was gone. America was unfettered. And yet these guys believe that the historical optimism carried them along, uh, mm -hmm. and which made them extremely reluctant to, to use power. The difference is, is, is this kind of righteous anger the fear, which kind of, the, you know, now the gloves are off. Mm -hmm. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Mm -hmm. which, so the historical optimism of the Clintonistas gets replaced mm -hmm. by a less powerful strain in American thought, but which has a place in American history, which is pessimism, deep pessimism about whether the world really is going our way and that we, you know, what is surrounded by enemies, by by, by the forces of evil, and unless we fight to the very finish, it's almost a biblical motif, the, uh, the children of darkness will win. Mm -hmm. And I think both of these parts 
are part of the American soul, though the optimistic part is the more powerful one. Mm -hmm. So that's why you get this violent response uh, uh, on, on the part of the, the attacked United States. Mm -hmm. So it's, a ki it's, a, it's an insecurity of fear, and a, a fear and, a, and a sense of uh, America's vulnerability. Yes, oh, the only way to deal with that vulnerability yeah. is to ex extinguish those who create it. Mm -hmm. And it's a fight to the finish. America's always fought wars to the finish. Think about World War I. Think about World War II. Um, and uh, it's only in places where the dangers became too, too high, like in Korea, that, uh, that one didn't fight to the finish, mm -hmm. but one fought to a draw. Mm -hmm. Now, after 9-11, as, as public consciousness developed about who the adversary was and so on, it, it, the, the, the Bush administration fell into what appears to have been a trap of only focusing on the military instruments of power. That, you know, and if we, if we look at this period uh, since 9-11, you know, we, we have de-emphasized the other instruments. Yeah. Why, why do you think that happened? Well, you know, as we used to say in the 60s and 70s, when we were kids, I can dig it. I can understand why. Yeah. There is, there was, the U.S. S s was sitting on top of, you know, the most superb military force the world has ever seen. I mean, in terms of sophistication, way beyond anything any, anybody else could field. I mean, configured for World War IV, and not just three, with, 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 with a, a panoply of tools that were just short of the miraculous. You know, they could intervene 10,000 miles away without bases or allies. It had perfect surveillance, real-time surveillance in the sky, it had precision munitions, all the kind of stuff. So, and, and the stuff really worked very nicely. Mm -hmm. So they go into Afghanistan, everybody said, the Russians found it on Afghanistan, the Brits found it in Afghanistan. So the U.S. kind of wins in about three months. Uh, and that created quite a temptation, you know, mm -hmm. we've, we've got the men, we've got the money, we've got the guns, but it doesn't cost us any men. Mm -hmm. You know, most of them die from friendly fire. Mo we got the money. Oh, do we have the money? We, we are now in this country fighting two, two wars without a tax rise. Unknown in the history of mankind. I mean, nobody notices the United States is embroiled in two wars. So, so that's again to, to emphasize and dramatize the novelty. That created enormous temptation mm -hmm. to use that tool and believe that the military tool can do it all, and that's what your question is really all about. Mm -hmm. There are tools and there are tools. There are jackhammers and there are dentist drills. And sometimes you need neither but uh, nice talking to and patience and suasion. Now, what, okay, we've experienced <laughs> this crisis. We yeah. have these instruments. This is an opportunity. How do you account for the focus on Iraq? Well, you know, I'm not going to get involved into Oedipal uh, stuff and psychoanalysis. It's fine. We heard that, that mm -hmm. stuff. So he wants to be the better man than his old man. Uh, um, I, I think there was some genuine fear, by the way, shared by lots of people outside the United States. Mm -hmm. The Brits, the Israelis, the Germans, the French. Everybody thought the man was building weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and, and that was not a very pleasant idea. So at that particular point, I think there was a confusion of enemies. I think the, the serious enemy was, has been, and will be Iran. And I think we ganged up on the wrong, we barked up the wrong tree. Why that obsession? I think Saddam, kind of offered himself up. He was mm -hmm. a real bad guy and he relished it. He relished being a bad guy. He loved, you know, shoving the extended finger mm -hmm. into, into people's eyes. And, and it was a kind of vendetta, a personal thing. 
Plus, as I, what I said, the, the, the true fear that he was, uh, he had used weapons of mass destruction. He had killed Kurds with gas. And, um, and who else was the United States going to attack? Saudi Arabia, well, that was an ally. Mm -hmm. Egypt, that was an ally. Mm -hmm. Jordan, it was an ally. Uh, Iran kind of, they had actually helped the US in the Afghanistan mm -hmm. war. Uh, so who else, who else could be attacked? Well, there then? was Al-Qaeda, but of course, well, but that had, yeah, that that's had, not a state. That's not a state, has no address, no yeah. targets, and so yeah. And And Saddam was a kind of perfect mm -hmm. character very familiar to the American historical memory, which is like Stalin, like mm -hmm. Kaiser Bill, like, like, uh, like Hitler. It could, it could be nicely personalized. So that is, is my explanation for the obsession with Saddam. But you know why, in the end, the idea was if we can get the baddest guy in town, that will be an example unto the others, and they will shape up and democratize and reform Etc. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, this uh, this new world. Well, before before I ask you about yeah. this new world that we're in now, I do want to ask you what? How would you characterize this leadership group that made these decisions? We, without necessarily getting into personalities, what I'm curious about. Which decisions? Uh, this guy? Th th that is the the response to 9/11. We're talking here about Wolfowitz. Uh, we're yeah, talking yeah. about Cheney. We're talking yeah. about Rumsfeld. It, what, were these men? kind of misplaced realists, basically, responding to this awful uh, situation? Uh, I'm not sure, because I have to preface this by saying, using that old saw, some of my best friends are neocons. Mm -hmm. Some of these people are, well, I won't, I won't use names, some of these people are exceedingly intelligent people. I mean, tr among the most intelligent people I've met, some. Uh, but I might also say that mm -hmm. W's grades at Yale were better than Carey's. Mm -hmm. And, but I'm, I'm saying that, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm stressing the exceeding smartness to, to, to stress the paradox. How could such smart people fall into su such obvious, obviously st stupid traps? I mean, how could people believe, very smart people, and you know, with experience in government, that you could just roll in there, topple the Saddam statue, hand over power and leave. And s two of these told me in the run-up, we're not going to stay very long. I said, you're not going to stay very long? What does that mean? Like, oh, maximum 18 months. So and you're going to transform the most pathological part of the most pathological area in the, in, in the world, the Middle East, in 18 months? It took you 40 years in Germany and Japan and Italy, you name it, it's, it's still there. And yes, and that's what we have. To, we have to get out in 18 months because we will become targets. That was very smart, right, mm -hmm. to say that. So if these people were that kind of smarts, how they could so gru gruesomely gru underestimate the, the, the task of reconstructing a conquered society, which is the core of your question, I cannot answer. It is beyond me. Even if you and I had sat there on the Defense Policy Board, we would have raised these questions. Mm -hmm. What about the schools? What about the water? What about the oil? What about the electricity? What ab who's going to man the traffic courts? Uh, what are you going to do about this army? You're going to disband an army of a million people? Aren't you going to be in trouble? If you, uh, so on and so on. Why there was this enormous failure of collective intelligence. And I asked one very smart man who was on the Defense Policy Board, I said, Jack, his name is not Jack, did you ever raise your voice? And he says to me, you know, Joe, I keep answering that, I keep asking myself, mm. why wasn't I posing those questions? Mm. Search me. Mm. Now, but now, not worthy of a great power, I would say. Yeah. Now, now, in, in looking at the world we confront, you, you basically, in, in Uber Power, and I will show the book again so everybody can go out and buy, buy this lucid uh, statement of, of where we are. Uh, you, uh, you, you turn to history to try to come up with uh, a strategy for the U.S. As, as it deals with today's world. And, and you want to take the best of two worlds, British uh, example of a, of the, of a balancer 
and outside balancer, uh, outside balancer and Bismarck's uh, uh, strategy of bonding. Ta of being a hub. In a, yeah. In a, well, the Brits did reasonably well for several centuries yeah. by staying outside, out, out of the troubles of Europe, always being the balancer and not never the balancee, mm -hmm. which means they always pulled out, they had no interest in the continent, and they, so, f in order to all the better you know, conquer the empire in India, North, North America, and and, and Africa, and it used its its insular position and its superb navy very much. You might say, well, the United States is Britain XXL. Mm -hmm. It's as insular. It has the British, what the British Navy used to be is now the U.S. Navy plus the U.S. Air Force. It can afford to intervene intermittently, be the over the horizon presence, the extra regional balance of all these terms that we use in our in our business. And I thought to myself, yes, there's a lot of, lot of um, good advice in this in this historical image. But you know, we no longer live in the world where it's about Europe and uh, the rest of the world is mine to conquer and to occupy and to rule as the Brits did. The United States cannot withdraw. It is in the middle and in the thick of things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the isolationist option mm -hmm. uh, as the Brits did and as the U.S. did in the 19th century. So therefore, you have to go to, to the opposite, which is kind of a hub and spokes model. How do you, you always want to make sure number one make, wants to make sure it stays number one, and that the rest don't gang, don't, don't gang up on it in alliance or coalition. <coughs> so the Brits always broke up hostile coalitions and then formed counter coalitions against the, the, uh, the bad guy du jour, the French, Habsburg, Spain, you name it. Uh, and I think that strategy won't work, and so, but the U.S. should try the Bismarck strategy, which is if you're in the middle of thing, you are the hub. You're at the same time the power that that maintains order, but you're also at the same time the largest threat to the system because you're the power, most powerful player. Mm -hmm. How can you be both manager and threat? Uh, how can it be power of order and the power that challenges the order by, by dint of its sheer weight and uber powerness? And so the Bismarck model then goes into a kind of bonding strategy where, or a hub and spokes model where it tries to have better relations with all this, the spokes than they have among themselves uh, to keep them from ganging up. And I said, I wrote, this is the more appropriate strategy for the 21st century, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. And that's now we come to my critical point. It's Britain is balancing, Bismarck is bonding. But I said, a 21st first century strategy has to add building. And really it's a plea to return to what I talked, we talked uh, at the beginning of this talk, which is the United States must build international public goods or, which is in other words for, for talking about um, supply-side diplomacy. Do things, institutions, international public goods, which by their very existence create demand for them, like free trade, like security, mm -hmm. like world order, and so on. So which the new version of the institutional order that we so created, yeah. Do well for yourself by doing good for others. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess one should emphasize that we are uniquely placed, the, that is the U.S., for example, our role uh, as a balancer may be very important in the future of Asia. With yes. all of these uh, competitors, yeah. uh, uh, potential competitors uh, going at each other in order, uh, and well, we, we're going to be necessary to keep the stability of the absolutely. region. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, there will be balancing, and you just mentioned a perfect example which has to do with Asia. Where quite clearly the U.S. provides the balancing dead weight against a rising China. But remember, I want Bismarck Plus. I want Britain and, Britain and Bismarck Plus. So at the same time, and that's really, really not bad what U.S. diplomacy has been doing. It isn't treating China as an enemy that has to be contained and balanced like the Russians. 
but they're trying to tr draw that rising power into the mainstream, in the international, the liberal international order, by trade, investment, uh, etc. And that is what I would call building, balancing, bonding, building. You offer even rising powers who have a good reason to resent you and maybe possibly to attack you, you draw them into the orbit, into a system from which they themselves profit too. And the way the United States is doing that in the Far East, and not too badly right now. So why has to give W some credit here mm -hmm. for his Asian policy? And think about Korea, painstaking diplomacy, leading the six powers into getting the North Koreans to, to, get to, to pretend at least to relinquish their nuclear weapons. That is what I call supply-side diplomacy. You provide the world with public goods, which makes the others want to be part of your system. The, the other element that you say is very important in this world is, besides the institution building, is legitimacy. Mm. And, and as an uber power that can lead, there, there is a problem set you have to work out to achieve legitimacy. Talk a little about that. Well, I come back to the basic idea. The, the problem for the United States is that it is the most important force of order or the manager of the system at the same time its largest, its, its, its largest threat because of its enormous uber power. Very difficult thing to do to be both the threat and the savior. Uh, uh, and, and that is a task for the, for the 21st century. And legitimacy is really another word for what I've been saying before. What is legitimacy? Legitimacy is that what you're doing is somehow right. Mm -hmm. And then how do you acquire that quality? Well, because what you're doing for yourself, you also do for others. And so that spells acceptance, consent, even cooperation. But influence and authority, which is very different from raw power and coercion. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think legitimacy is the kind of the soothing balm, you know, the kind of the kind of uh, smooth is the rough, very very rough edge of American power. Mm -hmm. I would say. And you, you quote Kissinger, who says American power is a fact of life, but the art of diplomacy is to translate power into consensus. Well, that's it. That's, that's what legitimacy is all about. Yeah. If, I can, if I can envelop my power in consensus, that makes, that makes me a legitimate player and that what I'm pursuing a legitimate pursuit. And once I have that magic quality, I don't need to force to blackmail or coerce or to brutalize people. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go to war. Power, the best kind of form of power, is when you don't even have to threaten, let alone to execute. You are uh, known as a defender of American culture mm. and a critic of those people <coughs> who overreact to America's presence in the world, the dispersal of its, its culture and so on. And, and I want you to help us understand how you think uh, uh, America can parlay that into uh, uh, yeah. restoring its legitimacy after what uh, is, yeah. is seen across the world as the debacle of Iraq. It certainly is. Um, very hard to do. It is true that you know the world eats, drinks, watches, dances, dresses American. Uh, and. Uh, I knew, I knew something big had happened when Starbucks opened up in Rome and in Vienna, the two coffee capitals mm -hmm. of the world, I mean. Or when, you know, uh, MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, came to Berlin uh, in 2004 and, you know, people spent hundreds of thousands of hours standing in line collectively. I knew there was something afoot. And, um, but the but the problem here is that this, uh, this, this attraction, this magnetism, or this, um, this um, demonstration effect, as the, the uh, I mean, the imitation effect, uh, does not translate into soft power. Mm -hmm. Soft power is 
when others do what you want them to do, which they wouldn't otherwise do. Without you hitting them over the head. Correct. Yeah. They do it. <laughs> you know that. It's, I think it's imitation without affection, or it's kind of intimacy without, without affection. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I think that most, the millions of people who imitate American ways, tens, hundreds of millions of people around the world who imitate American ways. I just saw a piece in the Wall Street Journal that the very rich Chinese now want to live in McMansions. Mm -hmm. I mean, American style McMansions. Uh, does not, uh, first of all, people may not know that they're imitating America. And even if they do, it doesn't turn into a kind of chips that American power or diplomacy might use, I think it creates more resentment mm -hmm. than affection because people don't like to be seduced. Mm -hmm. uh, people like don't want to be dragged from their own cultural roots. Uh, and you know, we don't like ourselves for being seduced or others for being seduced and we hate ourselves. We hate the seducer, we hate ourselves. So I think this phenomenon of anti-Americanism that you invoked a couple of minutes ago without mentioning it is in large part driven by this enormous at attraction or magnetism and the resentment that, that comes with it. That, you know, the world is becoming more and more American, but the world doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, if you add to that that globalization is essentially conflated with America, and globalization really means modernization, you know, wrenching other nations out of their, their old ways, which has losers and winners. So um, you end up with America carrying a lot of, a um, lot of resentments on its back for this kind of cultural, economic, and technological penetration of the rest of the world, plus its Gulliver-like uber power. This is a kind of nation that is not very lovable. Mm -hmm. Now, no, look, you <laughs> studied here as an undergraduate. You went to uh, Swarthmore, and as a graduate student, you got your PhD at, at Harvard. So, so you're you're a student of not only American culture but of American institutions. Yes. Do you think that American institutions can adapt now to embrace ideas such as you have, namely the the need? for working to build institutions yeah. and achieving, the, and how is that going to happen? I think, I think if you want to be charitable, the Bushes have already begun. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that arrogance, you know, that you're either with us or against us, you don't hear that language anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, coalitions of the willing and screw the rest. You know, NATO offered to actually fight in Afghanistan, and. Rami Rumsfeld says, we, we don't need you guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's already gone, mm -hmm. long, long gone, even with this administration. And there's a big cultural, so to speak, difference between Gates, the current Secretary of Defense, and his, and his predecessor. There is something else. I mentioned the Korea talks. That was really American diplomacy at its best. I want to kind of, uh, kind of stress that again. It's leading a six-nation crew patiently, intelligently, using just the right kind of pressures and incentives. And bringing the Chinese in. And bringing the Chinese and the Russians. Uh, not easy customers, all these mm -hmm. guys. I thought that already bespeaks a kind of cultural transformation that you, that you, that you just mentioned. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing um, um, succeeds like failure. I mean, if you fail, mm -hmm. You're going to have to change your ways, mm -hmm. right? And there's one thing that's true about America, for sure. This is, in most cases, it's not a very ideological country. In most cases, it sometimes can be. And uh, so it's no, no accident, comrades, as the Russians used to say, that philosophy of pragmatism was invented here. So I think there's a kind of fairly rapid self-correction mechanism in place here, which you could even observe its workings in this administration, there will be more of it in the next administration. Mm -hmm. So I have, I, I'm not too worried that, that the U.S. will fail in, in this kind of t cultural or diplo diplomatic tra transformation. 
in, in your characterization of this new world that we're in, you, you make uh, the point that, that many of the problems are planetary and, and that we're going to have to bring people on board. Let's, in that context, let's talk about Iran and Islam, basically, mm -hmm. because in, in, you know, in, in the national, th those are the two big uh, uh, problems, culturally and then in terms of uh, the most uh, important rogue state, I guess you would say, on the, on the horizon. Uh, how do we uh, uh, lead and achieve cooperation to, to deal with these two issues? Well, first of all, let's, let's take Iran. Um, I, 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 I hope I'm totally wrong with what I'm saying now, and I fervently hope so. But I think we can't, we can't stop Iranian nukes. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way we can stop it is by engaging into a very serious air campaign. It's not just you know, flying in and out the way the Israelis did it uh, with, with Iraq in 1982, I believe. Um, it's a serious, very serious air war which would take weeks because you can't just go in and bomb these sites. You have to first take out their air defenses, you have to take out their naval assets so they can't block the, the Strait of Hormuz and choke off the oil, etc., etc. I don't think the United States has a stomach for a third war right now. It is al already involved in two, Afghanistan and Iraq. The world doesn't have that stomach either. And uh, I don't believe in, dip in, in diplomacy because our good friends, the Russians, have uh, just in the fall of 2007 essentially kind of offered themselves as protectors and allies of Iran by claiming a kind of Monroe Doctrine for that area and said no force in this area. Mm -hmm. And you know whom they, they meant to address. And they're just basically playing a very, very unconstructive role uh, in, in this neighborhood. So I don't even think diplomacy is going to work because there will always be Russia that will <coughs> dilute mm. whatever everybody else. So uh, we are left with those, the good old standbys of the nuclear age called nuclear deterrence, mm -hmm. containment, alliances. And the way these, these alliances is kind of in place already, essentially the United States has the Sunni states and Israel pretty much on its side though. These are not, uh, I would not overrate the fighting power of these states except mm -hmm. for Israel. Uh, as far as Islam is concerned, it's very hard, kind of, you have to go back quite a while to, to, uh, to find an analogy in history where you had a combination of an expansion, expansionist, millennial uh, kind of histories on our side, ideology, combining with, 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 with multiple settlements of, of adherents of the faith, in throughout the world, where some of them could always, at a moment's notice, become a fifth column. I, don't, I have no historical analogy, you know, where, where a, a, a central, uh, where, where a religion could count on m that kind of militancy, I mean, ruthless, uh, unrestrained uh, uh, militancy, suicide bombing, and have its, its outposts in, in, in the entire world. Interesting enough, the only place where these outposts do not threaten mm -hmm. is the United States. Right. But they have used violence all over the world. And, and is that attributable to America's ability to assimilate? I think so. And yeah. perhaps and also... Europe's failure. Probably. Also, because America always gets the right kind of immigration. Mm -hmm. So it's... The Arab minority in this country is mainly Christian. These are people who wanted to come to this country, mm -hmm. high levels of education, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they replicate the basic, mm -hmm. the pattern of immigration throughout the ages. The best, the brightest, the most ambitious, and the best prepared. Um, and Europe gets a very different kind of immigration. Mm -hmm. um, Which is a product of empire, right? A product of empire, but also Europe hasn't even begun to grapple with the with these hard, hard ball problems of citizenship, integration. How do I become German or Italian? Mm -hmm. I don't know. How, do I be, how would I become an Italian? I don't know. I can live in Rome, but I'll never become an Italian. Mm -hmm. So easy to become an American. 
You come here, you buy an SUV, you join the Little League, <laughs> you put a flag outside, you shop till you drop, you go to baseball games, PTA, and you have garish Christmas decorations. <laughs> you become, you're an American. <laughs> I can't do that in France. Mm -hmm. I can't do that in Germany. I can't, you know, in Norway or what have you. So, so this, this absorptive capacity of this country still continues to flourish. Uh, but come back to the threat, which has become so concrete that so many of us are now ready to deny it is a threat. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, we know, let's not be, anti let's not be mm -hmm. racist, let's not be anti-Islamist. There's a real serious problem that we have in every large city in the Western world outside of the United States. How do we deal with this threat? Well, not in the cataclysmic, cataclysmic millennial way of George W. Bush. Let's find a war that we can fight. Mm -hmm. It is very painstaking, slogging police and intelligence work. And it's going to be, it's sine dia. It's, it, this won't have an end for a long, long time. Uh, and um, we have to fight that war, or whatever you want to call it. I know it's not politically correct to say, call it the war on terror. So this engagement, uh, uh, it's an open and open engagement. And we have to, we have to try as best as we can to kind of minimize the damage to our civil liberties. Uh, I already find there's something very demeaning when I travel in the U.S and go to the airport and have to kind of half undress. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I'm thinking about, I better not get a knee replacement because it's going to ring. And then I'm gonna <laughs> so it's, America's gone through these periods before we think about the Jefferson the Alien and Sedition Act. Some pretty mean stuff happened yeah, the here. Palmer Raid. What? The Palmer Raid at World War Time. Oh, Tom that Day. and the Nizay and the yeah. camps and, and, uh, and McCarthy and, and, and xenophobia, et cetera, et cetera. They kind of go through American history in a wave pattern. But the wave pattern means it disappears. And so I just hope we can get used to this long, long, drawn out struggle and just remember who we are and uh, not, to, not to subordinate an elusive idea of total security. Uh, no, not to, 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 to subordinate liberties to this elusive idea of of uh, of total 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 security. Joe, on that note, uh, I want to thank you for being here. I want to show your book again, Uber Power: The Imperial Temptation of America, and <laughs> we look forward to having you on our program again sometime soon. Thank You're you. a wonderful interviewer, Harry. <laughs> thank you, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.